Our next speaker is uh, Dr. Miguel Quinones, my, uh, my dear friend, colleague uh, over the years, uh, previous chair of cardiology, professor of medicine, and also the editor of our journal, uh, the Debeke Journal. Uh, really does not need an introduction. He's one of the fathers of, of echocardiography. But he's going to talk about stress testing in general, because I know many of you order them or would like to get them for whatever reason. Uh, and I think it's important to see, you know, what kind of stress test should you order or what would be appropriate? And I know it's hard to do within 15 minutes, but Miguel, you're the master at it. So it's great to have you. Good morning. Thank you, Bill, and good morning, everybody. Stress testing, so many choices. I'm confused. Even Dr. Zogby sometimes gets confused. <laughs> we have multiple clinical scenarios, and, and we have choices. So every time you, hope you get into that situation, ah, what should I use? So let's see if we can make this a little bit easier. So the outline of the talk is going to be, we're going to discuss the two most common scenarios. I mean, there are many other scenarios, but we're going to concentrate on the ones that you are going to see more often, which is the patient with chest pain. The question there is, do they have CAD, yes or no? You know, is the chest pain caused by CAD or not? I mean, that's, that's the most common question you're asking. There are a few other causes of ischemia not due to diseases of the major vessels. Those are more rare. Most of the time you're trying to ask, this patient has conventional CAD with ischemia. The second one is the patient that already has CAD. In fact, that one is tougher because we know they have coronary disease. Now they come in with chest pain. You, oh my God, is this non-cardiac pain or are they really having ischemia? So there the question is more frequently, you know, do they have ischemia, yes or no? Um, and then we're going to talk a little bit about the asymptomatic patient with CAD, um, which I think has been touched already very well. Um, so we have two clinic settings that we frequently deal with, right? The acute setting of the emergency department and the more comfortable chronic setting of the clinic. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. Uh, we're going to touch a little bit on coronary CTA. And uh, what do we do if a patient has a normal stress test? Are we done? Do we wish them a good life? So let's first touch on the chest pain in the emergency department. It's the most common cardiovascular, cardiovascular symptoms in an emergency department. Second most common reason at all to go to an ER. It's one of the three most common symptoms in a clinic. Even for us in the clinic, it's a very frequent symptom. A main difference between ER and clinic setting is that ER patient usually has symptoms that have been for only 24 hours or so. So there's a lot more acuteness to it. The clinic patient quite often comes in with chest pain for the past month, the past two months, the past few weeks. Rarely is that same day, the last 24 hours. And there's some differences because we know the rapidity of onset of ischemic chest pain, if it's really ischemic, has worse outcome. Where somebody shows up with angina going on for the last two or three months, it's serious, but it has less of that very in, in, in acute type of, of uh, uh, worrying about it. So the other side of the coin is that there's a high rate of non-ischemic etiologies in the ER, chest pains that are not caused by the heart. Uh, many of them are non-cardia, muscular, and so on. But beware of dissections. I don't have time to touch on dissections, but certainly that's one thing that can sneak in. And acute dissection does have some very specific qualities that we all should know about. The other flip of the coin also is that if you miss the boat and you send somebody out that was really having acute coronary syndrome, which can happen between two and 5%, uh, that has been associated with a high mortality, and of course, uh, lawyers love that one. So there's always that anxiety of trying to do the right thing and not miss that kind of patient. So the challenge is exactly that. In the emergency department where there's some acuteness, you want to re-stratify patients and make sure that it's safe to let them out. That may mean that you're able to say that they have no coronary disease, or it could mean that, yeah, maybe they have coronary disease, but you're able to say that they are not having ischemic chest pain and it's still okay to let them go out. So this is an algorithm that we use and many hospitals in the nation use. Patient comes in, you do the basic history, the EKG, the first set of enzymes. If any of that smells like ACS, that patient is going to go into an admission protocol and manage for acute coronary syndrome. 
either because the pain is classic, because the ST changes are there, or because the enzymes are increased. None of that happens. That patient then is in that gray zone. Could be, but also likely not to be. So they're putting some sort of observation status and you do something else. And that's where most hospitals in America now are using a stress test. If it's abnormal, then you move back to the um, pathway of um, admission and treatment. And if it's normal, they go home. So that's the frequent algorithm that many, many hospitals use, including ourselves. So now comes in, which stress test would you use? So you have choices, right? A routine treadmill, EKG, a stress echo, a stress nuclear. So what do the experts say? They're all appropriate to make that shoot. What, which one should you use? More confusing because they are, all three of them are perfectly appropriate according to guidelines. So let's start with the treadmill ECG. Okay, this is your poor man's horse. <clears throat> it costs even around a hundred dollars. So insurance companies love this test, and they would often try to ask you, negotiate with you, would you do that one instead of something else? But this is the reality. This is from large samples of meta-analysis showing that the sensitivity, and I'm trying to read. Ah, here we go. The sensitivities are somewhere in that 70% range. In one study, it was 90, but most of the others are in that 70% range. And the specificity, likewise, is the same. So we're, we're in a 70-70 ballpark here, which means you're going to have false positive. So if a test is positive, you have to kind of follow with something else, because it may be a false positive. Women do have a higher rate of false positive on the EKG. But if it's normal, you may also have a false negative. So that's where you are in a situation with the treadmill. So why even do this test if he has that type of statistics? Well, <clears throat> let me show you in a particular study that was done with about 1,000 patients um, with treadmill EKG, about two thirds were negative. Now, in that group of negative, there probably were some false negative from the statistics that I just showed you. A quarter were non-diagnostic, which is a big problem, because now you've done the test and you still are scratching your head. So now you have to go to something else, which delayed time in the ear and so on. And about 13% are positive. But even when they followed these people, they had a 3% event rate over six months, which is much lower event rate that I will show you when the other tests are positive. So that's kind of one of, of the situation with using this test in the emergency department. Having said that, however, if someone that comes in with chest pain to the ED, given that overall the incidence of ACS is, is relatively low, if they're on a treadmill and they have a great test, they go 10 minutes, they have no symptoms, the EKG is perfectly normal at rest and perfectly normal during stress, they do have a good short-term prognosis. And therefore, there are smaller hospitals in America, you know, 70 to 100 bed hospitals that have uh, don't have perhaps all the technology we have that still are using this test. And when the experts go together in the guidelines, they still made it appropriate, mostly because of this. Now, the question is, of the universe of people we see in an emergency room coming with chest pain, how many of them are fit enough to be able to get in that treadmill, give you those 10 minutes, smile at you, and feel great? So the problem is, you know, a practical application also becomes a limit. So that takes us to nuclear, which is the one that is used a lot. So the nuclear stress, the, the basis there is that you are looking at perfusion into the heart and areas that are so-called cold areas where you don't see much there. An absence means that that area is not receiving sufficient perfusion during the stress. The technique we often use here is that we do stress first and it's positive, then we go for resting. And in this case, you can see that at rest, that area now is properly perfused. So this was an ischemic response. If it's totally normal with stress, we save some time and not have to go to the rest. So the other beauty of this test is that you can exercise somebody in a treadmill if they're capable of exercising, or if they are obese with knee problems, and like many of our patients, then you just do a pharmacologic uh, vasodilator, which we're using regadenosone a lot more often now than any others. So uh, Dr. Navi, which you heard uh, earlier, uh, has been doing a little bit of research in this area. And he published, actually, in 2012, this almost 1,600 patients um, that came into our center. 
uh, looked at with a gate expect, okay? They were the classic patients that we see in our emergency room. I won't bother you with this section of the slide because they were the typical patients we see, mean age 55, um, most of them without known CAD. Um, only two clinical factors uh, for CAD, they are t low TME risk ratio, and we use pharmacology stress test in 90%. So you, that shows you the kind of patients that they are, the type of patients that often you cannot feel comfortable about throwing them into a treadmill. 683, 135 patients had a positive test, okay? Which is almost 9%. Remember, on the treadmill data with EKG, I told you about, it was about a 3%. So now we have, uh, they, most of them have good EF, and most of that positivity was true reversible defect, i.e. true ischemia. So when we look at that group, we see that those with a negative nuclear stress over two years, which is longer follow-up than many of these acute ER papers show, they had great outcome, and those with positive had much more issues, and frequently the issues were right, were right within the hospitalization. They, had, they, tru they truly have ACS, and they had to be treated accordingly. And some of them had, uh, after follow-up, they had uh, returned with uh, angina or coronary syndrome. But most of the events were early because they were detected and they were put in the hospital and, and managed. This is a, a, a meta-analysis of randomized trials showing, again, the negative predictive value of a normal nuclear is excellent, very, very high. And the positive predictive value is pretty distant, too. So that's one reason why this test in this acute setting has become much more popular. So it is an excellent imaging test to recognize high-risk patients presented to the emergency room with chest pain. What about stress echo? Well, here we have uh, two types of stress echo that we frequently do, the exercise and the pharmacologic with dobutamine. And in both examples, I'm showing you a positive test. Um, on this one here, we see that the Ejection fraction drops, and there's a fair amount of multiple wall motion abnormalities. In this one, when you, we get to the high dose of the butamine, all of this distal area doesn't contract well, consistent with a significant LA deletion. And years ago, we were able to do uh, classic studies where we compare both nuclear and, and echo and high, high number of patients, and the relation was excellent. There was a very good agreement between exercise nuclear, exercise echo. Meta-analysis have been done showing the same thing, that both have very similar sensitivities. There was always an argument of specificity in the way I read it to me, both are very similar on both camps, sensitivity and specificity. But this is exercise, okay? And that same group of patients that we initially reported, we then followed them over several years, and we showed that the prediction of outcome was the same for both tests. So stress echo with a treadmill on exercise is a very, very good test. And in fact, it is, if you look at the appropriate next criteria, both nuclear and stress echo are very well considered appropriate tests in this setting of chest pains. However, dobutamine should be only used when people cannot exercise. I see a lot of dobutamine being ordered in people that you look at them and they're totally capable of exercising. The butamine is an inferior test to exercise. So you should always order exercise first if the patient is capable of exercising. The other thing is, if the patient cannot exercise, I don't, I don't have time to show you all the data, but clear, tr uh, clearly, nuclear vasodilator is more accurate than the butamine stress, particularly in people with left ventricular hypertrophy, small ventricles, and of course, with dobutamine, you do have some atrial fibrillation, frequent PVC. So in the acute setting of the emergency department, if someone cannot exercise, it makes more logic to go the way of the nuclear. And you saw in our study that 90% of the people in Dr. Navi's study were done with uh, vasodilators. So stress echo is best for exercise. So again, you know, patient comes into the ER with chest pain, they have normal EKG, normal enzymes, they can exercise, Stress echo is an excellent, excellent way of to go. It's quick, in and out, you're done, patient can go home. Resting echo is a different story. Resting echo only has value if you are suspicious of more deep heart disease. Patient have an abnormal EKG with ST changes, LVH, Q waves, 
something abnormal that you're concerned about myocardial disease. They already have CAD, previous MI, you want to know the EF. They come in with dyspnea. That's a very appropriate use of echo. Or you're concerned with pericarditis. But if you take all that away and you have the routine guy who comes in at 50 with chest pain and none of these things, the test is worthless. And we're seeing too many of these resting echoes being done in this setting where basically you're increasing cost of care and time in the hospital because you're not going to gain much information to help you in the management if you don't have some of that background to uh, help you with. Now, you've seen about coronary ICT. You're going to see more about it. It's an excellent test, particularly if it's clean. If the coronaries are clean, it has an outstanding, outstanding negative predictive value. Tons of data on that. So much so that four randomized trials have been published on the use of coronary CT in the ER. And they all have had good sample sizes. Follow-up have been between six months or one month. They all have shown that a negative CTA, patient goes home and they have practically no events in either one month or six months. So it's an out outstanding test to exclude CAD or include CAD, and if they have CAD, then you have to go with something else. The cost savings is an interesting battle because you gain some cost in early on, but the total hospital cost is about the same. So you move the patient faster, you can get the patient out, the ER costs are less, because, but because you put the cost of the test, it's a washout in terms of cost. So the best benefit of CTA in the ER, if you were to implement it as a routine, is in and out, patient getting in and out faster. So it is an excellent, excellent alternative in the ER setting. So now let's talk about many of the patients you see, patient in the clinic coming with chest pain. And this is what I would say, something I would recommend, okay? Low risk patient, younger, normal EKG, they can exercise. Even a routine treadmill might not be a bad idea, okay? Insurance companies actually will push you that way more than anything else. If you are kind of, I just want to reassure the patient, I don't think the, really the patient ischemic, they don't have that many risk factors. They get on a treadmill, they give you 11 minutes, they go fine. I think you're okay for that point. You haven't excluded CAD, but you probably are, are, are dealing with a patient that has a very low risk event, okay? It has lower cost, lower cost. Um, now, if the patient has moderate risk, some abnormalities of EKG, or is a woman that we know have more false positive, it's better to go with an imaging test. And if the patient can exercise, a stress echo, again, gives you a quick in and out, no radiation, and you get the same results from the point of view of yes or no and prognosis the patient is unable to exercise, then we lean more towards a vasodilator um, spec than a dobutamine echo, but those are my own personal bias. Many other people order dobutamine stress. I mean, it could be an alternative. And then if abnormal, of course, you're going to move forward with something else, like CAT or CTA. Now, what about our CTA? CTA is coming quickly to the picture. Clearly, if a patient has left bundle branch block, where all of these other stress tests are going to give you trouble, that's the way to go, probably. CTA is probably the way to go with a dead bundle. If you already have a positive stress test, then you need to have confirmation. CTA is becoming more and more frequently used. And if a patient has very high risk factor, negative stress, but classic angina, sometimes we say, you know, the symptoms are so classic, I need to know more. That's another very good use of CTA. Now, what's next? Patient is excluded, they have no symptoms, or you have taken care of ruling out ischemia. Don't forget the patients still have risk factors. You heard two excellent talks on that, on risk factor modification, doing the right thing for the patient, and using calcium scoring appropriately because it can really help you a lot. And Faisal, you may have shown this slide, it came in a little bit into your talk, but this is a very powerful slide. 44,000 people, follow over 15 years showing you a calcium score of zero. Basically, they're undestructible. And the more positive the score, the more issues. So it's a very powerful test. Faisal gave a great talk on that. I'm not going to spend a lot of time in it. So in summary, chest pain in the ER is less often cardiac origin, but failure to detect the real McCoy can get into catastrophic results. In the ER, both exercise echo and trauma spec have excellent negative predictive value, allowing safe discharge of patients. In the clinic setting, Exercise ECG, stress echo, and SPECT are all appropriate choice depending on what we talk about. Age, ability to exercise, gender, risk factors, uh, uh, resting EKG, and so on. 
And CTA is an excellent alternative in the ER to restratify patients and get them out sooner. Uh, you have to have all the engines available to do it rapidly. And in patients that have significant risk factors, calcium score can provide an excellent way. Notice that I have not touched on one thing that many people do, the executive physical treadmill. You probably get very little from that. If someone tells you in the history that they can play racquetball, you don't need a treadmill. You may need a calcium score, however. So think about that when you're talking prevention. Instead of doing a so-called executive treadmill, which is basically a, a money machine, order a calcium score if you think the patient is in that category. What's coming? Next year, we may be changing the topic. So what's coming is functional flow reserve, which we're beginning to start doing, which is a way of putting a functional component to the CTA, and CTA with PET, which gives us a much more accurate assessment of perfusion. These two tests, uh, we're happy to say we are getting into them. Dr. Zogby has recruited a real guru on PET. So a year from now, we might be changing a little bit of our talk and introducing some of these new modalities, which are going to definitely make an impact in how we care for patients. Thank you very much.